Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. some sun after a lot of rain in the week it's still cold out it's in the 30s uh but anybody that knows me knows i'm good with that um <clears throat> my uh throat is finally getting better meaning my voice is uh well on the mend uh hopefully i'll be 100 percent by tomorrow uh which is kind of the reason i'm here i'm here to tell you i'll be back on the sunrise project which is um, a project created by Kelly Lawson, who is also uh, a client of mine, and uh, I've worked with her and also her son. And uh, she created the Sunrise Project after an incident in which her son attempted suicide. And this is before she met me, and they literally brought me on as an expert in trauma and I became a resident expert and then on uh, the network on picked up the podcast so it became a part of their podcast catalog anyway uh, we I came on I looks like I probably may be on three weeks in a row because I wasn't scheduled to be on until next week uh, being February talk about ways to love black men and ways to uh, bring love back into the black family and love black women uh, not in the romantic sense but in the uh, execution of love and that's still on I don't know if we're going to change it since I've been on three weeks I don't know how many of the subscribers want to see me three weeks in a row but uh, nevertheless uh, I'm going to be back again this week I was there last week talking about what happened with the Tyree uh, Nichols thing, but more from a sense of how it impacts others outside of the immediate periphery of the event. In other words, outside his family, the neighborhood that he that that it happened in, uh, as a whole, how is it impacting others, especially within the black community? Um, that's a that's what uh, can be referred to as a cl collective experience. 9-11 uh, was a collective experience, probably one of the most memorable and lasting collective experiences uh, that uh, reverberated across uh, racial lines, ethnic lines, religious barriers, political barriers, and so forth. Uh, we can say that a number of others have happened before and after at different and varying levels. Uh, the George Floyd situation was galvanizing r across racial boundaries, which uh, isn't always the normal. Normally, it's us getting, you know, getting into who, for, for instance, Mike Brown actually created a great divide uh, because it immediately put a white officer in jeopardy, Darren Wilson, and we saw what we saw. So there are all these things going on, and what happens to the average black person when they are able to see something like that? Uh, I don't watch police brutality videos or kill videos or violent videos amongst anybody anymore. Uh, I was able to assess working with my own therapist the damage that it was doing probably about five years ago and I stopped. Um, I will analyze all of the information that is surfacing about a video to gather uh, with pretty good accuracy 
what happened in the video. I don't need to see it blow from blow. I need to know specifically uh, the dynamics of it, uh, what brought it about, how was it carried out, at what point in the attack was the subject subdued and there was no longer need for force. Was the force at the level it was exhibited necessary? Everything else is just flooding your your brain and your mind and your soul and your spirit with negative energy that has a neurological and biological negative impact, not to mental, not to mention mental impact. Impact. So what we're going to be doing in the second part of this, we talk about how it can affect us and that it's traumatizing, that literally you're traumatizing, uh, it can be desensitizing, it can do so many things that can alter the social uh, balance of uh, the norms and standards that create your social expectations and uh, a lot of things can come out of this over a long period of time it's it, it also has epigenetic influences in other words it's influencing uh, gene responses gene activity it's up regulating certain genes down regulating certain genes uh, increasing the risk for uh, developing uh, any of a number of uh, any and of a number of diseases like cancer diabetes lupus uh, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, negative environments, negative experiences aren't simply things that you process with your mind. Your body experiences. As a matter of fact, it's your body that keeps the uh, keeps the score, as Dr. Basil Van, Van der Kolk would say. Your body is the one that's logging this. Every cell has its own memory, and it's logging it. And when that cell goes through mitosis and recreates new cells to replace it, that memory is passed on. So we have to understand that that's why you can have something that you don't even process mentally trigger you. That's one of the easiest, matter of fact, that's one of the easiest ways to be triggered by your trauma is a biological stimulation in which the cells of the body uh, detect a, a risk based off of a past experience. And the thing is, you don't have to have experienced it. You could have simply seen it and, and, and it became a part of a, once Once you're traumatized by something, not... Once, once you experience it as trauma, it's logged, and now you need to confront it, you need to deal with it. We're going to talk about some ways to mitigate that. We're going to talk about uh, coping mechanisms, but we're going to talk more about healing and what it takes. Uh, you know, there's this old adage that says, time heals all wounds, and that's the, it's absolutely false. Time does not heal all wounds. Uh, if you don't take the necessary precautions to, to deal with the wound, to deal with something that has called harm to you, harm to you on a physical level, on a, on, a, on, a, on a spiritual level, on an emotional level, you will see in almost every instance negative consequences. You break a leg if you don't get it set right, if you don't get the right amount of uh, the, the nutrients necessary for that bone to heal properly and expeditiously. You're going to have long-term effects. And it goes on down the line. You have to engage the wound. You have to engage the, the hurt. You have to engage the thing that has caused you uh, damage. And then in that, you initiate the healing process. And over time, you heal. But just simply thinking, if I just wait, I'm going to be better. Uh, normally what you do is you become accustomed to uh, the state that you're in and you normalize it and it becomes your new uh, your new baseline of behavior, thinking, processing, but it's actually lowered your ability to cope with life as it comes. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that on a collective level, on an individual level. And I'm going to be fielding a lot of questions uh, for people who want to call in. Maybe you have a situation yourself or maybe you have uh, a loved one that you're concerned about. We're going to talk about it all. So uh, I invite you to join us. Um, I'm looking forward. You guys have an unbelievable day.